Hello. Uh, so it's about time. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so I'd like to thank you all for coming to the maintainer track session for operator framework, where we're going to talk about what we've been working on, new stuff coming down the pipeline, and new people that have joined the project. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so who are we and why should you listen to us? Uh, my name is Jonathan Burkhan. I'm a, an open source contributor for IBM. Uh, I'm currently a member of the steering committee for Operator Framework, which is a CNCF uh, incubating project. Uh, I'm also a maintainer of Operator SDK, one of its sub-projects, uh, and previously I've worked in the open source uh, cloud platform space for a while. I've worked on Kubernetes before that I worked on Cloud Foundry. Uh, and then we also have Attila here from Red Hat. He's going to introduce himself a little bit later on when he's talking about his stuff that he's been working on with Java Operator SDK. Uh, so for those of you who maybe are new, what is Operator Framework? Uh, so Operator Framework is an open source toolkit to manage Kubernetes applications uh, called operators in an effective, automated, and scalable way, uh, and to implement these by modifying the Kubernetes API itself. Uh, so some of the things we make that you may have heard of include now, as of uh, this year, Java Operator SDK, which has just joined the project and we're really excited about. Uh, and then some of our older tools that you've probably used or heard of are uh, Operator SDK, uh, Operator Lifecycle Manager, OLM, and the Operator Package Manager, OPM. And uh, if you're even, uh-oh, did I skip one? Oh, I did. Uh, if you're even newer than that and you don't even know what an operator is, uh, I'm going to try and give you the two-minute summary, and hopefully that'll be enough to help you understand the rest of what I'm going to be talking about. But uh, So operators are a design pattern for creating software that runs on top of Kubernetes. Uh, and the intent is that rather than by statically deploying your software in a pod and hoping Kubernetes will, you know, It'll recreate the pod if it blows up, but it's not going to know the application-specific knowledge that your, your app might need to actually be handled by Kubernetes. Uh, and encapsulate that in a controller. So we're, we're calling it an operator because the functions that it's replacing is usually the domain-specific knowledge that would be encapsulated by a human operator. Uh, and sort of the simplest possible example of this that if you're at all familiar with using Kubernetes is uh, you've probably done something like kubectl create pod before. And the way that actually happens is behind the scenes, there's a process called the pod controller that will see when you create that pod and then actually go and make that pod happen, like actually make a Docker container come into existence on a machine somewhere in the cluster. Uh, so we're just going to replicate that control flow in our thing where you're going to, you know, you have your application, your thing, we're going to make a controller such that you can say kubectl create your thing and there will be a your thing controller that goes and makes it happen, whatever that means in your application specific uh, uh, example. Okay, so going to dive into what we've been cooking up the past couple months. So the big thing we would like to announce is V1 uh, for not exactly OLM because OLM is kind of going away. So we're, we're doing sort of a major uh, version refactor of a bunch of our internal APIs, which we are collectively calling V1. Uh, in terms of making operators themselves using Operator SDK, that's not really going to change, and hopefully we should be able to pull the rug out from underneath everything, so nothing should change from a operator developer's perspective. Uh, but major things are going to be changing in the back end, and that's what I'd like to discuss today. Uh, so OLM and its resources like catalog sources and all that are sort of going away. Um, Hopefully, uh, sort of the intended use case for operator developers is that you're using this by writing bundles, uh, and those should all stay the same, so you shouldn't have to worry about catalog sources and all of that unless you were, for some reason, using them manually, in which case uh, I think you might need more help than I can give. Uh, moving forward, though, it is the intent that the new resources are uh, more human-friendly. Uh, so if you do need to use these manually, uh, hopefully it should be a little bit easier to understand. Uh, so the two main components that we're going to start with are catalog D and operators. Uh, so these are two new types that we're you know, sort of introducing that we're going to be implementing as controllers. Uh, first, catalog is sort of, sort of going to be the replacement for catalog source. So you're going to be able to add a catalog to this, for like operator hub or perhaps your own private on-prem one, uh, and it's going to look at those and download the APIs the, sort of the same way it does today when you point uh, OLM at 
uh, operator hub or what have you. And keeping up with the sort of like uh, package manager language that we're sort of trying to replicate, if you're familiar with like a Linux package manager, this is sort of the equivalent of yum repo. Uh, so you can add a repo to your thing, see what's available on it, uh, browse things and choose to install them. And then the operator controller is sort of the equivalent of yum install. This is going to be a type that sort of represents an operator itself uh, and has all sorts of various flavors for doing version management. Uh, now the intent is that those are going to be the primary interaction points for sort of cluster admins. So if you have a, a cluster uh, that's running in production and you want to be able to install like the actual finished product, that's going to be the APIs that they're going to be interacting with. Uh, and these things are still going to support bundles, which I'll go over to in a moment. Uh, so if you want to keep interacting with them the way you already do with OLM, that workflow should be exactly the same. Um, where it's gotten a little bit more granular is we have a new set of APIs that are sort of explicitly intended for development or more direct interaction. Uh, so bundles, we're changing that into it's an actual type, bundle deployment, um, that's going to encapsulate a little bit more than bundles do today. So we're, like I said, we're going to continue to support our own native bundle format. We're also trying to massage things that you can support different backends of bundles, uh, primarily Helm charts. Uh, so if you want to write your operator, publish it as a Helm chart, and use that within our ecosystem, uh, that hopefully will be doable. Uh, and then we're going to have this thing called Ruck Pack, which is sort of the machinery backend, the stuff that actually moves stuff around, makes it happen on the cluster, actually downloads stuff, stuffs bundles and images, gets everything where it needs to be. Um, although that is sort of, everything I've just said is, is pretty well defined at this point. We're pretty sure that's what it's going to look like, uh, except for Ruck Pack, because we're still exploring uh, some alternate avenues of maybe using some third-party packages instead of our own homegrown thing. Uh, but that's still sort of brand new. Uh, so hopefully, if everything goes according to plan, V1 should be a lot more user-friendly in a couple ways. Uh, one, uh, OLM's API was solidified before really everything about the way CRDs work was finalized. Um, so now that that's all sort of set in stone, our API is going to be a lot more kube-esque, a lot more declarative and more aligned with sort of the, the mainline kube API philosophy. Uh, all of this should hopefully be more GitOps friendly, uh, a lot more easier to automate and easier for humans to personally use. Uh, and hopefully everything should be a lot more non explodey uh, if you've ever had to go in and debug when you're trying to install a bundle on OLM and something breaks, it can be very difficult to back out and, uh, you know, perform brain surgery, and hopefully this should alleviate a lot of that. Uh, so we're really excited about that. It should be coming out at least in the, the uh, trial version relatively soon, so look forward to that. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass this off to Attila, who's going to be talking about Java Operator SDK, a new sub-project. Need this better. Right. So welcome everybody. Hope you can hear me. I'm Atta Mesaros. I'm maintainer of Java Operator SDK, and this year Java Operator SDK joined Operator Framework. So on this occasion, I will give you a brief overview on the project. So what is uh, Java Operator SDK? So probably you already guessed this slide from the name, but it's basically a feature complete production ready framework to write, makes it very easy to write operators uh, and controllers basically in Java uh, for Kubernetes. It has a core framework and some additional components. And naturally our targets are users uh, or Java developers or, and the, our users are Java developers who implement their services in Java. And they don't want to introduce additional language or uh, framework or something to a project, but mainly language in Go, uh, then uh, you just want to use Java operator and write operators in Java. So what are the other components of the SDK? It basically, as I mentioned, contains the core uh, framework, which is built upon the Fabricate Kubernetes client. It's a Java client. It's already put a lot on the table. It supports generating Java classes from custom resource definition, but also other way around. It has all the facilities that the Go Kubernetes client has, informers, leader election, and basically everything what's in Go. 
Uh, we support explicitly integration testing in the form of a JUnit extension that helps us a lot also to testing the framework. And there is a support for major Java frameworks, especially Quarkus, and, but also Spring Boot. There is also a plugin to operator SDK to scaffold the project and a separate framework to implementing conversion hooks and dynamic admission controllers in Java uh, for Kubernetes. So basically, these are the major components. There are a few more, but these are the more significant ones. Um, so a little bit more about the Quarkus extension. Quarkus is a major uh, cloud-native Java framework, generic Java framework, and basically we support an extension uh, for that, for Java Operator SDK. It, again, adds, it builds on top of the core framework, but uh, brings a lot on the table. It supports Helm, OLM, and pure Kubernetes resource generation. You can build your project or compile project to native binaries and provides all these goodies from uh, Quarkus, like this nice configuration approach. The Quarkus has this build time optimization, so something that is normally would be done in Java in runtime, in Quarkus you can do in build time, basically. So it's a great place to start with. It's uh, probably um, much more efficient than the core, at least in some regards. So a little bit more about core framework. I don't have time and don't have to go into details what is included in the core framework. It's basically very simple, uh, or very similar to the Go contra runtime or the frameworks in Go, but it's a little bit in a Java way. So there are obviously these differences in languages, but um, otherwise the concepts are almost the same. It's, it, well, however, it tends to be a little bit more batteries included. Uh, when we started the project, we actually was managing multiple external resources, not just resources in Kubernetes. So in that regard, it's more like uh, there are already components to manage uh, resources, events, polling, and stuff like that for non-Kubernetes resources. That's probably on top of what uh, Contra Runtime does at the moment in the core. But it's also a little bit higher level on some features that I will a little bit talk about also later. But to show you just some code, just to, you can imagine, to implement your reconcile logic, you have just to implement the reconcile interface in Java. And in this met one method, reconcile, you will just receive the uh, sample custom resource, the primary resource, and some contextual data and additional functionalities. But you basically implement your own logic as you would do very similarly in, in Go. And at the end, you might want to patch your status of their custom resource or the resource. So it's basically the basic API is as simple as this. And from that point, you can just three lines of code and run the controller. And basically, that's it. So what do you mean it's a little bit high level in some means, some regards? Basically, if you, for example, just to highlight this, there are finalizers in Kubernetes. You, you already might, might know. You use finalizers when you cannot clean up your resources that you manage in a reconciler or in a, in a controller by garbage collector of Kubernetes, or basically if you don't, cannot put their owner references on your resources. And so then you have to explicitly clean up uh, the resources that you created. And for that, you have to add also finalizers to your custom resource. That makes sure if even the controller is not running, the resource is not deleted until the controller explicitly states it might be deleted. So, but basically, semantically, this means that you have to just do some cleanup. So in Java operator SDK, what we have to do is just implement the cleaner interface, and that you bring this cleanup method and just implement your cleanup logic. But everything else, like handling, adding the finalizers, removing the finalizers, maybe postponing the remove of the finalizer, is just handle it for you directly in the core of the framework. So in this regards, it's a little bit different than contra framework. It's more like these problems are abstracted away for you and handled for you in the background. I believe in Go, you have to use some libraries direct in the reconciliation, handle it for yourself. Um, in addition to that, we also provide some even higher web abstractions and components I would like to talk about a little bit. It's, uh, 
when you basically want to create some resources, manage some resources in your reconciler, it's going to be a very similar process almost uh, all the case. Basically, for example, if you want to create a custom map or manage a, uh, a config map, uh, always what the, the flow is goes like this. You check if the, it's a config map is in the cache. If it's not in the cache, you create the resource. If it's in the cache, you check if the config map is a desired state, uh, what you want to achieve. If it's a desired state, then ideally you don't, know, don't do any updates or any explicit calls to Kubernetes API, but uh, if it's different than the desired state, then it's basically you will update the resource. So we can generalize this workflow also for non-Kubernetes resources, but also for Kubernetes ones that you manage. So and basically, as you maybe you notice, this input for this workflow is just a desired state. So we provide this abstraction called dependent resources. It abstracts away this problem and just based on desired states, it basically uh, reconciles for you these resources. And not just that, it does much more, all kinds of use cases to use uh, server-side apply or not, if to use uh, some, if there are some cases when you want to have a dynamic number of resources, or if you have external resources which want to, for which you want to store some explicit state, and it makes sure that it's implemented for you uh, in a correct way. So in practice, this looks like that you would imp have a class config map dependent resources just extends uh, Kubernetes as dependent resource. Here CAD means that it creates, deletes, updates the resource if necessary. And you just provide the desired state. So here's a config map nicely built. We have just the same name in the same namespace than the, your custom resource. And you just put some data from the spec. And this is enough basically to have implemented the whole reconciliation for you in the background. So from this point, you can just use this uh, in the reconciler. As you may notice here, in the, you can just annotate it with a dependent. That it say that I have this config map dependent resource. I want you to this reconcile for me and I want to have this desired state on the server. And before the reconcile method is called, the framework out of the box makes sure this resource is present on the server or in the Kubernetes API. But you can also, if you have some more specific places you want to reuse them, you can just explicitly call the reconcile API of that dependent resource and it makes sure that the resource is reconciled for you. So this will make sure there is a config map with the desired state on the service with just basically a few lines of code and it makes sure it's correctly implemented. But usually you don't have just one resource that you uh, manage on the, in, within your reconciler. So usually we are managing multiple resources. These are multiple dependencies, multiple annotations. And sometimes you just have these flows that you don't want to have this resource basically in all cases. You don't want to create ingress if some custom resource spec is different. For example, there's a feature flag to just to create a ingress or not. So for that, we can have just all kinds of inputs for these dependent resources, like preconditions and post conditions to manage that, that flow. And there are basically few constructs. We call it workflow that executes this reconciliation. And reconcil uh, the reconcile precondition first, it tells that if the re uh, resource needs to be there or not. It's kind of a precondition. But there is also the special thing called depends on. So Kubernetes doesn't really care about ordering of resources, but in some cases, especially make you make, a, for example, a deployment and you want to make an API call on that service that you just deployed after it's up and running, it's kind of an ordering. And if you, but also if you manage some external resources, you create an S3 bucket and then an RDS database that will back up to the S3 bucket, it's kind of a precondition that the S3 bucket lives before you are starting to deploy some database. So there is kind of a natural use cases when you need some ordering. And this depends on, you, may, you might recognize from other tools, it says that this resource needs to be reconciled after other resource. So with these uh, constructs we call workloads, you can just very nicely define uh, some 
some you, our user asks for state machines that we call it workflows, that we can make sure the, uh, there is, are these dependent resources which request as each resource, but then there are these workflows which kind of make sure that uh, reconciliation within multiple resources are done optimally. So that means it's re concurrency is baked in, so everything is concurrently reconciled, what needs to be reconciled, or can be reconciled concurrently, and it's async. So for example, if you are waiting for a, a database or deployment to be started and ready, the, it will, won't block the thread, it will just exit and reconcile again when the there is some changes happening in the background and the trigger is triggered the reconcili reconciliation again. But there is much more to it. I don't want to go into details, but this might resemble you something. It's, it's actually was motivated or by these classic uh, infrastructure as a code tools like Terraform, CardFormation, Pulumi, or you might want to know, or you might know. It's uh, basically just adopted to the Kubernetes landscape. So we are doing just same degree of resource management, or providing this component to which you are able to use and describe these use cases inside an operator, and it makes sure it's optimal. It makes sure there are the informers and the caches and everything related to that uh, handled for you in the background. And basically this resulted, we started to work on this about two years ago. It's, there are very some nice examples in production there, which, and this resulted a very easy and nice, optimal, and basic correct way how to implement this reconciliation. Of course, it's not for every use case, but for the use case when you are managing these resources, this typically these risk for resources in your controller for Kubernetes. So this is kind of a, a more abstract and high level abstraction that Java in Java operator tries to be a little bit innovative and uh, yeah, implement and help users and developers with this experience. So basically, that's all what I wanted to talk about and give the introduction. So if you have any questions for us, then feel free to help uh, ask. And if you can come up and ask them into the microphone or raise your hand and I'll come around so you can speak into the microphone and it'll be on the recording. Uh, I can just... Okay, this is way easier for me, so thank you. Um, Hello, uh, great talk, first of all. I have a question for you about the uh, change to V1 for OLM. So um, I just wanna make sure that I understand it correctly. So bundles can now be backed by Helm charts. Like if, so for instance, if I do, if we do an operator release and currently that release involves building a bundle and pushing it to like a bundle registry, and also uh, like an official Helm chart release. Could we just do the Helm chart release and then have the bundle be backed by that? Or how would that look? Uh, yeah, that's the intent, is exactly that use case because there are lots of people who want exactly what you want. <laughs> uh, so yeah, hopefully that's, that is one of the, the specific uh, target cases that we're shooting for. Uh, any other questions? Anybody at all? If not, uh, that's pretty much it. If you'd like to come up and discuss, you know, more about Java Hyper SDK, we'll be around. But thank you all for coming. Thank you. Very much.